Hi, my name is Dan McGuigan. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. If you haven't already, I'd recommend you check out my first video about the scientific concept of species. In this video, we'll be focusing on discovering species in the 21st century with some examples from my own research. So why do I specifically say the 21st century? Well, that's because, as you might imagine, the way in which we discover species has changed pretty substantially over the past few hundred years. So in the 19th century, for instance, species discovery was often done by folks like Constantine Samuel Raffinesque, shown here. And people like Raffinesque would go around the unexplored areas, at least for Western science, and they would document all the diversity they saw in meticulous field notes and by preserving specimens. And once they returned to their home museum or university, they would often write these lengthy monographs describing everything they encountered on their travels including descriptions of any new species that they observed. So down here, you can see an example of a species description from Raffinesque, and he uses pretty vague language, such as mouth rather beneath or forehead rounded. Um, it's very imprecise. It'd be very difficult to tell exactly what fish he's talking about here, or even indeed whether he's talking about a fish at all. So how has that process changed going into the 21st century? Well, like Rothenesque, I study North American freshwater fishes. It's an incredibly diverse group of organisms with about a thousand or so described species. And the diversity is centered in the southeastern United States, as you can see on this heat map here. So it's also an extremely well-studied group of organisms. There are actually three textbooks that are currently being written about just about North American freshwater fishes, each of which is several inches thick. Now, despite all of this study and, and, and long history of, of documentation of the fish fauna of North America, we're still discovering new species every year. One group in which we're discovering quite a few new species are the darters. We think that there are about 250 species of darters, but that number, of course, keeps increasing, and they make up a good chunk of North America's freshwater fish diversity. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to be focusing on one species of darter, the green throat darter, Ethiosoma lepidum. They're quite colorful, charismatic little fish. They only reach three to four inches in length. And during the breeding season, the males will develop these really vivid colors. The green throat darter, Ethiosoma lepidum, is found in the southern United States, in Texas, and in New Mexico. Here's a little map to show you its current range as far as we know. All the black points on the map represent locations where this fish has either been caught or observed over the past few hundred years by scientists. And you'll see that most of those points are concentrated in Texas, in the Nueces, the Guadalupe, and the Colorado River basins. However, there's also some disjunct populations way up here in New Mexico in the Pecos River drainage. And it's actually this geographic isolation that got us interested in this group to begin with. These two populations in Texas and New Mexico are separated by about 200 miles of arid and seemingly inhospitable habitat for these little freshwater fishes. And indeed, since they are fish, they would have to take a much longer journey to go visit their closest relatives. So given this geographic isolation, we wanted to know, is Ethiostoma lepidum really just a single species, or are there perhaps multiple species? hiding within this group. So to answer that question, we're going to utilize the general lineage species concept, which I discussed in my first video. As a recap, the general lineage concept looks at speciation as a process whereby one species diverges into two or more. And as that species diverges, it accumulates differences, say ecological, genetic, or reproductive differences. So using this framework, we can look at many different types of data to decide whether we're looking at one species or perhaps multiple species. So we're going to look at three types of data going forward. First is genetic data, which we'll use to reconstruct the evolutionary history of Ethiosoma lepidum. Then we'll look at morphology, the way these fish look, their body shape. And finally, we'll look at coloration. As you saw, they're very brightly colored little fish. Perhaps there are some interesting differences there. So the very first step to all of this, though, is to actually collect the data. In order to do that, we can't just go to our local fish store or pet store. We have to actually drive all the way down to Texas and New Mexico and catch these fish. Using nets and other techniques, we can scoop these fish up. We can then process the fish by, say, taking photographs to document coloration, taking cl fin clips to have tissue samples for genetic analyses, 
and by preserving some of these fish for future studies of morphology. We bring all of that back into the lab with us, back in Connecticut, where we can extract DNA, we can amplify certain gene regions, we can do things like clear and stain fish, as you see on the bottom left, to look at bone structures. And of course, all of this then requires hundreds or thousands of hours of computational time to analyze. Okay. So now let's get to the results. First, we want to know, are there any genetic differences among the different populations of Ethiostoma lepidum? Now, to do this, to answer that question, we're going to first remember that all species are related through common ancestry or shared ancestry. We depict this shared ancestry in a branching diagram like this that we call a phylogeny. At the tips of the phylogeny here on the right, we have the living species. And further back in time, we can find their common ancestors. But how do we actually go about inferring the, this phylogeny for real groups of organisms? How do we figure out how different populations or species are related to one another? Well, one way we can do that is with genetic sequence data. So DNA is comprised of long strands of four molecules, which we abbreviate as A, T, C, and G. We can sequence these strands and compare the sequences from different individuals or different species to each other. So for instance, maybe we sequence a stretch of DNA for six individuals, and we notice that some of them have a G at this particular position, whereas others have this blue A, as you can see highlighted. So our, maybe we might hypothesize that a simple explanation for this is that the individuals that have this blue A are more closely related to each other. We could depict that relationship with something like this, a simple branching diagram where at some point along the branch leading to those individuals that with that blue A, there was perhaps a mutation that occurred from a G to an A. This is the basic idea that's behind all of the analyses that we do to infer phylogenies. Of course, when we're doing this with real data, we're working with hundreds or thousands of sequences and many, maybe hundreds or thousands of individuals. So it requires some pretty advanced computational and statistical tools to parse all this out. But this is the basic principle. Now, on top of just inferring the splits in the phylogeny, we can also estimate the ages at which those splits occurred, the timing of these divergences. One simple way we can do that is, what's, is using what's known as the molecular clock. This is the observation that in some cases, mutations accumulate at a constant rate through time. So if we know something about the rate at which mutations accumulate, and we know how many mutations there are between two different individuals or species, we can estimate the age at which those individuals or species or populations diverge from one another. So what we have now is not just a phylogeny, but what we would refer to as a time calibrated phylogeny. So let's take that approach and apply it to Ethiostoma lepidum. We went out and sequenced a handful of genes from many individuals across the ranges of these species. And here's what we found. I'm going to walk you through our results, starting with the oldest split in the phylogeny. So about 8 million years ago, Ethiostoma lepidum, or rather the ancestors of Ethiostoma lepidum, diverged from the ancestors of another species of darter called Ethiostoma grammi. Now within Ethiostoma lepidum, you might, we might expect that the oldest split would be between these geographically separated populations in New Mexico and Texas. But what's surprising was that the earliest split, the oldest split within Ethiostoma lepidum, was actually between the ancestors of the populations highlighted in red and the ancestors of the populations highlighted in gray here. Now, this seems really counterintuitive. These gray populations are separated by, as I said, 200 miles or so of arid habitat. But we have to remember this occurred maybe 3.6 million years ago. The environment looked much different back then. In fact, if we look at the geologic record, there is evidence of, of ancient riverbeds that connected these rivers in Texas and New Mexico. So clearly at some point, or it's likely at some point, that Ethiosma lepidum was more widespread than it currently is, maybe spanning that current gap in their distribution. If we go ahead to the next split in the phylogeny, we find that about 3.3 million years ago, the ancestors of the populations in green in New Mexico diverged from the ancestors of the populations highlighted in blue in Texas. So what we have is three very distinct lineages, the red, blue, and green lineages, each of which diverged around 3 million years ago. So given this evidence, we might start to think, well, 3 million years is quite a long time. 
maybe these are actually distinct species. So to try to address that, to try to further this hypothesis that there's multiple species within Lepidum, we can start looking at different pieces of evidence. So first, let's look at morphology. That is how the fish actually looks. Morphology can come in many forms. We could count the number of spines in a fin. We could count the number of scales along the body of a fish. But what we're going to do here is actually quantify the overall shape of the fish. To do that, we're going to use an approach called landmarking. Landmarking is simply uh, taking points along the body of the fish that we can identify in many different photographs. So if we photograph any fish from the side like this, we can always identify a point at the tip of the upper jaw, for, for instance, or at the insertion of some of these fins. So we take these points and we can represent them in a sort of just two-dimensional space like this, maybe a little bit more clear if I outline the points a little bit like that. We do this for hundreds of fish, and we, but we want to have some way to compare all of the different body shapes that we observe within Ethiostoma lepidum. So to do that, we're, for, we're going to need to reconstruct what we call a morphospace. Now, a morphospace is just a representation of morphological variation within a group of organisms. So here, we have two axes, the x and y axis. This will be a two-dimensional morphospace. In the top left quadrant of this morphospace, we might have fish with body shapes that look something like this. In the top right, we have different body shapes. We have more arched body shapes versus sort of a more uh, a deeper and larger belly, if you will. And in the bottom quadrants, we also have uh, uh, shapes that represent those areas of morphospace. So where might this example fish belong in this morphospace? Well, if we quantify it using those landmarks and we run our statistical analyses, we find that this fish falls about sort of in the center of this morphospace. It's kind of an average fish. But we can do this for many, many individuals from all three of these genetically distinct lineages and compare and see what patterns start to emerge. So here are the points are colored based on those three old genetic lineages that I talked about a few slides ago. And there are some subtle differences here. Um, if you look a little bit, you can see that the green points most of the green points are in the top two quadrants of this plot, whereas most of the blue points are in the bottom two quadrants of the plot. We can run statistical analyses to actually compare these distributions to compare their, their, their body shapes. And what we find is that there are some statistically significant differences between all three of these uh, lineages. It's maybe a little bit more clear if I illustrate with an example. So here's a fish on the top from New Mexico, the bottom from the upper Colorado River. In white, I'm going to highlight the caudal region of the fish that's, that leads up to their tail fin. Now, if we blow that up, you can see that there's a slight difference in the length of these caudal regions. And this is something that holds up when we analyze many individuals. Indiv fish from the upper Colorado River tend to have longer caudal regions than those from New Mexico. And you might say, well, that's just a tiny little difference. Why does that matter? Well, Remember that these fish are in water and swimming, and so the caudal region is actually very important in propulsion moving through that water. So slight differences in the shape of the body might have significant impacts on the swimming performance of these fishes. Okay, so we've observed that there are, genetically dis there are genetic differences and there are morphological differences between at least three groups within Ethiostoma lepidum. Let's look finally at coloration. Why might we want to know about the color of these fish? Well, if you've watched my first video, you'll remember that reproductive isolation is one of those very important characteristics that we talk about when describing species. And it turns out that in darters, color is very important, a uh, very important aspect of reproduction. So here's a video. You're going to see two different darters of a different species. Closer to us, closer to us, you'll see a male with a brightly colored fin, and in the background you'll see a female. This male is, is following this female around in a, in a courtship uh, display. You'll see him raise his colorful fin, trying to basically attract the attention of that female. If he's successful, if the female approves of his display and, and his coloration, he may gain the chance to reproduce. However, if he has perhaps slightly coloration that's slightly different or, or, or doesn't do the right display, he might lose the chance to reproduce with that female. So there's color seems to be important 
in reproduction here. And there's evidence actually from studies that suggest that females are able to discriminate, they're able to tell the difference between males of their own species and males of other species based on their colors. Not only is color used in uh, courtship between males and females, but it's also used in competition between males. So here you see two males lined up against each other. There's a female in the background that they're sort of following around. And the two males here are competing for the access to court that female, essentially. You see them lined up against each other here with their fins raised, displaying at each other. So not only are the color of the fish important in, for the female's choice, but also for competition here between males. So what we did was we went around and we drove across uh, Texas and New Mexico and photographed males from different populations of, these, uh, of Ethiostoma lepidum. When we put it all together, we find that there's a lot of variation in the color of these fishes. But there are some distinct differences between the three genetically distinct lineages that we've uncovered. So first of all, the, new, the fishes from New Mexico, highlighted in the green box, always had darker body pigmentation than the fishes from the upper Colorado River or central Texas. Another striking feature that was different involves the fishes from the upper Colorado River. In their first dorsal fin on the top of the fish, they always had two bright blue bands, whereas in the rest of these fishes that we observed from central Texas or from New Mexico, we only ever found one well-developed blue band in these fish. And that holds up when you look across many individuals. So we see that there are some potentially uh, diagnostic color differences between each of these three lineages. So to summarize, we have three evolutionarily distinct lineages that diverged millions of years ago from each other. They differ slightly in their body shape and they differ substantially in their coloration. So all of this evidence together suggests that we have not just one, but actually three species within Ethiostoma lepidum. Now you might ask, why does it matter whether we recognize Ethiostoma lepidum as a single species or whether we recognize it as three different species? Well, let's take a look at Roswell, New Mexico. Right around Roswell, you can find one of these new species that we've just discovered. Here's an aerial photograph from 1985. You can sort of see the town on the left and some agricultural fields surrounding the town. If we move forward to 2016, you'll notice that there's a lot more green in the photo and the town itself has expanded as well. So here's side by side, maybe a little bit easier to see the differences between 1985 and 2016. So over the past 20 or so years, Roswell and other areas in New Mexico have expanded. Uh, and these expansions put a real strain on the local aquatic ecosystems. All of the water in this region, or most of it, is derived from the aquifer that's underneath the ground. This aquifer is used to irrigate crops and to irrigate humans. But uh, that aquifer is also used to supply the water for the local streams and rivers in which this fish can be found. So in some sense, this fish is in direct competition with humans and, and, and agriculture for access to their habitat. And in fact, if we look at the distribution of this new species in New Mexico, there are a number of black points shown here, which are historic records where this fish has been found. But unfortunately, it seems like there may only be one or two stable populations that are still in existence today. Now, one of those populations is circled in red here, happens to be right in the middle of a national wildlife refuge, which is incredibly fortunate. These preserved areas can protect species that we never even knew existed. But we can't always rely on luck alone to get us through, to get us by. If we want to protect the diversity of life, we need to actually know what the diversity of life looks like. We need to know how many species are out there in nature. The federal government passed the Endangered Species Act in 1973, but without actually knowing what the species are, there's no way for the government to step in and try to preserve this incredible diversity of life. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge that Science is always a collaborative process. There are many other people involved with this particular project, aside from myself, including my co-authors, who are helping to write up the results of this for publication very soon. And many people have helped collect these fishes and the data that was used to generate the results that you've seen. If you like this video, please check out our YouTube channel or our website for more videos about frontiers and fundamentals in ecology and evolution.